Okay, before we get started with 5.3, let's do a little review question. Which of the following is true of passive transport across a membrane? Is it A, it occurs with the concentration gradient? B, it never involves a protein transporter? C, it occurs against the concentration gradient? Or D, it always involves a protein transporter? Go ahead and pause the video, think about that one. Okay, the answer in this case would be A, it occurs with the concentration gradient. That is the definition of passive transport. Sometimes it involves protein transporters, sometimes it doesn't. Remember we have diffusion across the membrane that doesn't involve transporting with pro protein transporters, um, but sometimes it does. Sometimes we have those channel proteins that allow things to move through. All right, we're gonna talk about the cell wall now. So we talked about the membrane, we're gonna move a little bit outside of that and talk about the cell wall and the outer layers. Um, we'll look again at that structure we talked about it previously, but we're gonna we're gonna hit it again. Um, it will explain how it protects from osmotic shock. That's basically having too much or too little salt uh, or solutes outside the cell. We'll talk about the gram-positive cell wall. Uh, it has things called tychoic acids in it and uh, also peptidoglycan. And then we'll talk about the gram-negative uh, outer membrane and look at LPS and the periplasm, as it's called. So the cell wall, like I said, it's a cage, but it's actually a single molecule. All the molecules in the cell wall get all linked together, so they're all bonded together, forming one continuous kind of cage around the bacteria. Almost all bacteria have a cell wall. There are some exceptions. There are a few bacteria that have lost their cell wall. Oftentimes, these are intracellular pathogens. They live inside of other cells. So things like chlamydia. Chlamydia is a bacteria that lives inside of cells. Uh, it has lost its cell wall because it doesn't need it. Peptidoglycan is the main molecule in the cell wall. Uh, it consists of polymers of disaccharides we call glycans, uh, linked by short peptides, which are small proteins. So peptidoglycan. That's the name. Um, I'm going to show you some of the structure. Don't freak out. Don't memorize this. But I want us to, to see a little bit of what's going on in here. Okay, so there's these small peptides here that link these sugars called nag and nam. This is the peptidoglycan uh, here. So there are a bunch of bonds in here that cross link or bridge across between the cell wall parts. So these long chains of NAG and NAM here, the glycan bits, and then they get linked by these protein bits called peptides. So the peptidoglycan, and they link like this. Now, this peptidoglycan is unique to bacteria. So of course, we're gonna target it with antibiotics. We'll see here, uh, there's a bond that forms that we target with penicillin, our first antibiotic. There's some other ones um, that get targeted by different antibiotics. We'll talk a bit about how peptidoglycan is made here. Don't memorize this too much. I, ju I just want to show you a mechanism of how an antibiotic actually works. In this case, we're talking about a group of antibiotics called the beta-lactam. These are penicillin and related antibiotics that are like penicillin. And they disrupt the forming of peptidoglycan bonds. So peptidoglycan, remember, is unique to bacteria. It's not made in a human cell. So the wall needs to be tight, right? The wall needs to be tight because it prevents the cell from bursting as osmotic pressure builds or shrinks. If you disrupt these linkages, the cell wall just falls apart and the cell will very easily burst. So what penicillin does is it disrupts what we call peptidoglycan synthesis or creation. There's an enzyme here that forms the bond between NAG and NAM and the uh, um, two chains here. This enzyme catalyzes that reaction. It makes this uh, bond here that holds the whole chains together, makes that whole shell. 
penicillin is a molecule that actually fits into the enzyme and blocks its ability to do this reaction. So it blocks this reaction, which leaves gaps in the cell wall here. And those gaps allow the cell wall to basically fall apart and then the cell will expand and basically burst after a while. So penicillin just blocks up the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. So penicillin's working here on this bridge formation. You might use that to treat like pneumonia, strep throat, syphilis, gonorrhea, we saw that in a previous example. Vancomycin, a different antibiotic, uh, affects a different part of this uh, peptide bond. You might use that on like C. diff or staphylococci, although some are resistant to that now. So I told you we use these, but of course bacteria evolve resistance. The most basic way that bacteria evolve resistance is they have evolved another enzyme that we called beta-lactamase. Remember the penicillin, we call that a beta-lactam. Beta-lactamase, this ace part means to chop or to cut. So beta-lactamase is an enzyme that degrades beta-lactam. So what it does is the bacteria makes this enzyme, which goes out and finds the penicillin and chops it up or degrades it, and then that opens back up the enzyme and now it can build the cell wall properly. So we found an antibiotic, bacteria evolved a resistance to it. Now we gotta find another, bacteria will evolve to that. It's an ongoing fight. Remember we talked about the differences between gram positives and gram negatives. We're gonna go into detail again about that just to reiterate it. Remember the positives, they have that thick cell wall, multiple layers of peptidoglycan. Uh, one of the common phyla, we'll, we'll talk about this in bacterial diversity, but the phylum firmicutes, uh, bacillus anthracis, streptococcus, pyogens, those are some common gram positives. They have a different wall, so we need different antibiotics against them. Versus gram negatives, they have that thinner wall, single layer of peptidoglycan, but they have two membranes that surround this. The common... Uh, Phylum for that is proteobacteria, things like Escherichia coli, E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This different wall means we use different antibiotics on them. So remember the gram positive, thick wall, single membrane, big layer of peptidoglycan. There's also some molecules in here called tychoic acids. Not super important to know them, but uh, they help bind this thick peptidoglycan together, and our immune system actually recognizes tychoic acid, so our immune system can recognize gram positives versus gram negatives slightly different. And remember this thick wall that retains the crystal violet in the gram stain, so it stains the bacteria purple and it stays purple the whole time. Gram negatives on the other hand, remember they look different, they have two membranes and a thin layer of peptidoglycan. On the outside, they have toxic bits that can be endotoxins to us, like that LPS. This is the part that makes us so sick from things like E. coli and salmonella. Um, the inner membrane, this is really technically the cell membrane. It's most similar to the cell membrane in a gram positive. Um, but this thin peptidoglycan layer, this is why the gram negatives stain pink. Remember the crystal violet goes in but then we apply our decolorizer, the alcohol, which washes it out. And then uh, it's clear, but then we apply it like a saffron and counter stain, which stains these pink. This LPS layer, this, this is the part about the gram negatives that makes it so difficult to deal with. There's something called lipid A in there. Um, this is the endotoxin bit. So when the cell membrane gets broken apart, say we apply antibiotics that kill the cell, it releases this lipid A, which is toxic to us. It overstimulates our immune system. And uh, it can also help resist phagocytosis by white blood cells. So this is the, the toxic bit, and this makes treating gram negatives very tricky. This region here, where the peptidoglycan layer is, is called the periplasm. It's between the two membranes. The two membranes are actually held together by some proteins, 
um, this murine lipoprotein. It holds them together, so it's not like the membrane's going to float away or anything. They're actually attached to one another. So I would like you to be able to tell the difference between these two if I were to give you an image that was somewhat like this. So be able to know gram positive versus gram negative. All right, we've talked a lot about gram positives and gram negatives, but there are things that don't gram stain regularly. Uh, other bacteria can have different membrane and uh, wall constructions. In the case of mycobacterium, we talked about, right, mycobacterium tuberculosis in the very first chapter, grows in the lungs, develops very slowly, and mycobacterium leprae, that causes the disease leprosy. Um, these have a very thick cell wall that's made up of what we call mycolic acids for mycobacteria. This waxy kind of um, thick coating actually resists the gram stain. So if you try to gram stain it, it doesn't really work. It also causes them to grow very slowly. That's why treating tuberculosis is very difficult. It develops very slowly and it's very difficult to treat because this is highly resistant to antibiotics. Uh, they kind of can't penetrate through this large layer. So let's look at a case history here that involves the bacterium Mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy. In this uh, example, you can see lesions on this person's skin, uh, on their face, their lips, their nose, things like that. These are caused by the bacterial infection Mycobacterium leprae. So you'll notice the lesions on the face. They're actually from the response of the immune system to the bacteria. The body is responding and it's causing these uh, bumps and things. The bacteria spreads through nasal secretions, so it's not just by touch, it's through nasal secretions. And we don't really understand why, but only 5% of people that are exposed actually develop the disease. What makes this difficult to treat is this large cell wall means that this bacteria grows really slow. And so you might be exposed and infected, but it takes years for the signs and symptoms to develop. If you even want to grow this in the lab, it takes six weeks to culture it. So working with it, identifying it is really tough. Um, it likes lower temperature regions of the body. So you can see here on this um, thermal image, the regions that are hottest don't really develop any of these bumps because the bacteria likes a slightly lower temperature. Um, and you can identify the bacteria in here by taking skin scrapings and you have to stain it with a different stain called acid fast where you heat it up to allow the stain to penetrate through that thick cell wall there. In this case, this patient would be put on a, a series of antibiotics that would last for two years. So leprosy is very difficult to treat and it has a bit of a stigma. People thought that it was passed by touching people. So a lot of times they would basically force people with leprosy into uh, communities where they all live together called leper colonies. But we now know that we can basically deal with this with antibiotics and we've in most countries dealt with all known cases early on so that uh, we don't spread it from person to person. All right, so we talked a lot about cell walls here. The cell wall, its main purpose is like a cage that protects the cell from that osmotic shock, right? From bursting. The cell membrane, osmosis happens across it, water moves in, the cell starts to swell. That uh, cell wall prevents that from happening and we call that turgor pressure that keeps it from bursting. Gram-positive cell envelopes, they have a lot of layers of peptidoglycan. They got some tychoic acids in there. Our immune system can recognize those, so we recognize gram-positives different than gram-negatives in our body. The gram-negative has those two membranes. The outer membrane kind of regulates nutrient uptake. It helps exclude toxins. There's a bunch of protein pores and transporters inside the envelope. There's also this LPS molecule. That LPS can uh, release when the cell is burst or lysed and it's released as an endotoxin that can be very damaging to a patient. Mycobacterium, 
has a very different cell wall, right? It had a very thick, complex cell wall with those mycolic acids. That means that it can uh, exclude most antibiotics. They can't penetrate through there. It prevents phagocytosis from our white blood cells and it slows nutrient entry and that leads to really slow growth. So the disease progresses very slowly and it's very difficult to treat then. Okay, that's it for 5.3.